Okay, well, I lost you, and then I didn't, and then you're back, so. Oh, boy, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> Good. Well, welcome to the show, everybody. All right, perfect. I'm going to pause this. All right, so welcome to the show, everyone, just in case you can't hear Frank, although I think everyone can. Um so this is my solo show at M Galleries P and A and the curator Frank May. Excuse me, I gotta fix my new hairdo. Uh hello is gonna be in the gallery itself showing off the work. And we're going to be um doing not only a gallery tour, a gallery opening. We have some questions that we're gonna do as part of an artist talk. Um and I'm really excited. I'm probably going to say this a few times just in case people pop in during the um, the initial um, or in the middle of the talk. All right. Let me <coughs> try closing this. Sounds good. So do you want to jump into your, uh, your background about your work, your your school? process yeah absolutely so uh, i um i went to uh art school at mason gross school of the arts and i graduated there in uh, 2005 and then i eventually went on to get my graduate degree in um in art education and i've been i guess a working artist ever since then i've been um creating work in my studio for a number of years and I try and um let's see can I do that too just in case um and I, I try and use a, a little bit of a mixture of pop culture and um fine art to uh mix inside my work so this whole series is kind of a m more pop art series than I've done in a very long time mm -hmm. Just gonna say hello to the room. Yeah, it's a wonderful hybrid. Go ahead. No, great. Yeah, what were you saying? Yeah, so it's a, it's a it's a nice hybrid of a few different things. You know that you have this the pop you know mindset where everything can be art, but you have this like consistent theme you know process. Can you can you talk about the uh, title of the show me and uh, why you decided to use this format? Um, I really like staying in uh, a form. Uh, it, it, the word format's actually a good word to use. I really like kind of taking a format and then tr kind, trying to uh, give myself almost like a false sense of rules and then having to use my creativity yeah. to stretch those rules and to bend those rules, to break those rules, and to reinvent those rules. Um, and I think when you're an artist... Uh, those rules don't really exist uh, in the studio. They might exist in culture, maybe good taste, and uh, inflammatory speech are really the only lines that you can or can't cross. But um, mm -hmm. it, it's my way of kind of putting my own set of rules together, and then it gives me a chance to try and uh, stretch uh, stretch an idea and kind of take it to its eventual conclusion or eventual, like most likely conclusion. And uh, mm -hmm. sometimes it's more successful than others. Uh, but I find the constraint can be fun. But this actually came from um, my solo show at the main gallery or M Galleries One. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and I had this kind of this character uh, called Osa Grasse, which just means fat bone in Italian. And I, I kind of <laughs> was taking this idea of I, th I thought it was really funny that there'd be, you know, a, a chubby little skeleton because the skeleton really doesn't have any fat on it at all. But. Um, <laughs> yep. But to me, like, the there's, <laughs> there's Osa Grasse. Yeah, and I was like, oh, how can I make this character seem like a real thing? And so I um, 
I, I kind of took the, um, I kind of took the, uh, what do you call it? The, um, Super Mario 3 logo box, uh, this video game that came yeah. out for the Nintendo Entertainment System when we were kids, had, um, Super mm -hmm. Mario in a, I don't know if he was wearing a raccoon tail or the Tanuki suit, but basically he was wearing one of the power-ups on the cover and he's kind of like jumping because that's really what mario does he jumps and i've always kind of had an affinity for that character because I, I love the idea that like this dude who's a plumber is sucked into another universe and then is like uh mm -hmm. has to save it um and also i i, I kind of relate to being mm -hmm. an, Ita an italian american from the east coast i kind of see some of myself in super mario hello eric sorry mm -hmm. to say Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. And, and you yeah, these uh, these feel like they're video games. Oh What's yeah, that? You, you you can even see in like uh, the Beast and Batman, um, some of these characters really look like Super Mario wearing someone else's costume. Um, and mm -hmm. then I was kind of like, all right, well, I've done so many of these. How can I kind of take the form and change it up? So I, I started out with doing like Super Mario as Batman and then Super Squash because I'm really into cryptozoological animals as well. I love the idea of these mythological animals that may or may not exist out in the wild. Um, I guess we can argue about that in the comments if you're really into uh, Bigfoot or whatnot like I am. Um, but I, I... And then I kind of moved on from there I, I i like the simpsons a lot so i i was trying to uh bend the simpsons work um into yep, my back, back to the, the grouping here. yeah like to me um yeah and i love the uh go ahead yeah i love like the, the knockoff you know version of bart as bort <laughs> And you kind of play with that, kind of with that, yeah, with the off-brand tap one across the hall here. So I'm going to go across and take a look. I think it's just a lot of fun to play around with the the generic brand concept or the knockoff concept. Yeah, because I feel like stealing is a really important part of fine art and art history. Um yeah. Artists have been stealing from each other since the beginning of time. Um, but what's funny about it is I can take an idea from somebody, but if I do it in my own way, I'm really... I'm not taking the original from them. It's not actually stealing. It's more like paying homage or reworking, remixing. And uh, and I, I felt like The Simpsons was, was a good second or third step in this series because Matt Groening, the... the uh, the creator of the simpsons is is known to have a huge bootleg bar uh collection of his own he'll uh he'll <laughs> buy stuff at shows that people make of like bootleg stuff of his work because he's just tickled pink that people like his work enough to spend time to try and remake it or rework it um i don't think he buys stuff that's like trying to pass itself off as the simpsons but like you know like black bar t-shirts from the 80s and 90s he's, he has a big collection of those and um and i remember posting this the homer simpsons and someone the homer simpson one and some guy posted on instagram like you know i hope uh you better not let matt graining find out what you're doing because he's gonna sue you i'm like yeah that's what that's what, <laughs> some billionaire who lives in hollywood is gonna sue me because i made a a watercolor, a badly done watercolor of his <laughs> character. Well, it's different. Than not, uh, I think there, it's not. You're clearly not trying to mimic the Simpsons. I think you're trying to use the Simpsons as a tool, right? But even still, like, um, you know, the Simpsons was not his first choice for putting stuff on the Tracy Ullman show. Right. He wanted to do um, the bunny, what is it? Uh, I can't even remember. That rabbit character. Yeah, and that was his original yeah, idea. Like, but... something, uh, something or other. Yeah, and, and he, 
he just didn't want to give up that character to some he didn't want to give it to HBO or to the production company and, and, and worry that they might have partial ownership of it. So he kind of just made up the Simpsons on the spot. I mean, Homer's named after his father. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, right, right, right. And, and so, like, um, in some ways, it's all kind of like a, a, a reaction to... I don't know, it's... In, in some ways, like, I love the Simpsons because it's a comment on modern american society and now it's gone on for so long now it's the villain and people are making comments about the simpsons now including myself and and it seemed really yeah. obvious to jump from one pop culture thing to another and um and i and i find the benefit of of pop art is that even if someone doesn't understand uh contemporary art as a thing you know, or understand art history, you can kind of um, hook them in with a familiar character. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You may know nothing about Gauguin, but you you've seen you you've seen Homer Simpson on a T-shirt. You recognize what this dude is. <laughs> you know, and, and in some yeah, ways, right, right. like, you know, the it might be one of the greatest works of art at least currently still being worked on, you know, like mm -hmm. the stuff we think of as being like high art at one time was also pop culture. Like people used to go to Shakespeare yeah. plays and heckle the actors, you know, and they got to pay to be in like the, uh, the front row to like throw stuff at the, the at the performers and being an actor was like a, a second rate job. But now we think of these things as high yeah. works of important literature <laughs> and I'm not saying yeah. this to diminish Shakespeare or any of the other great works of art that came out of the Renaissance or even ancient works of art, pre-Columbian stuff. I, I'm just pointing the, the 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 lens on the idea that like some of the things we think of as garbage today may have way different significance in, in the future than we think of it now. Um, oh yeah, that's for sure. And, and, and Look, I, I I could be making artwork about all kinds of stuff, but I I don't I don't know if it really speaks to anyone else but myself or you, you know, or anyone outside of the 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 insular art world. But uh, if I put a, a a Rick Sanchez picture on the wall, people start to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, well, speaking of our history, uh, so the, the leap comes from Yves Klein too, right? So you're you're playing with the uh, the, the photograph, right? I love that photograph, and, and, and it, Yves Klein, like that was a guy who really understood modern media and understood how um, all of this stuff could be m manipulated. Um, that famous photo, if you're not familiar with it. And I know you are, Frank, because we studied it together. Um, yeah. But to the viewer, that, like, there's a picture of Yves Klein jumping off this eight-foot wall and um, basically onto a paved street and sidewalk. And it's done basically with trick photography. It's all done in the photo studio with actual, not Photoshop, but in a Photoshop using light and and developing. Basically, <laughs> he had a big crash mat there, and he, and he did uh, had two photos and he overdubbed one on, to, on top of the other, so it looks like he's diving to his death. Because if you don't know, and as a parent, you become very, very aware of the fact that anything above the height of a person will usually kill them. Like, a fall at that height is, is yeah. potentially deadly. Um, and it takes, like, a trained athlete to be able to jump from anything above your personal height. So, like, that's why, you know, people will fall down from, like, standing up and they're totally fine. But that that because he got rid of the mat in the photo, there's a real sense of danger. And he's using this kind of yeah. uh, new media, not new medium at the time, but, like, the medium of photography to really play with this idea of danger. I mean, this is the same guy who copyrighted his own shade of blue, who would then use naked women to paint on giant canvases in his, you know, in his signature color. Um... This guy really understood how media worked. Um, 
like him and yeah. Duchamp, I really, I feel like, I feel like they could understand it in their bones. And, uh, <laughs> and, and really, this leap really directly came from uh, Super Mario. But it wasn't until I was like, oh, I see where I'm going from. Like, this is where this is from. I also think of, like, uh, the Salvador Dali photos of him trying to photograph people jumping to make it look like they're flying. That's not some great work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something that he would experiment with. Um, and also, all, all, a lot of this stuff has parallels. Um, either to mm-hmm. other um, works of art, other works of literature. I have multiple screens going on right now, so I think you're looking right now at this Superman. Is that the one you're looking at right now? Yeah, Superman. Yeah, yeah like Superman is based on the Ubermensch from Nietzsche. In, in, in many ways like he's the mm-hmm. ideal person and he was he was designed by two um i guess they were the children of immigrants but of jewish german descent immigrants and the idea being he was mm-hmm. just like indestructible because of all of the issues that jews faced <clears throat> while living in europe and and uh mm-hmm. and I, I really feel like that superman was kind of designed in a, in a in a sense of the, these nerdy children of immigrants to kind of feel more, uh, better a little bit about, um, oh, we're not receiving enough, oh, it's, we're starting to slow down a little bit. I hope that's okay. Let me see if I can switch. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, uh, no, we're good. I think yeah, again, good. you know, it's well, I love the, uh, I think the, the art term is, uh, there's this wonderful postmodern pastiche that you create. So you have this like this superhero character uh, Mario. Like, I never thought of Mario as a Superman until I saw this. Strangely, you like, oh yeah, he is a Superman, <laughs> and he's like, but just a different a different world, a different sphere that he's from. And I love that mishmash of that with you know leap into the void and the uh, you know just the the different aspects of pop culture kind of like thrown together in this in that pastiche kind of mode and then repeat it over and over again in a very pop way. It's really, uh, you know, it's, it's good stuff. Yeah. And also like, I mean, if we want to try, I want to try and kind of like a highbrow view of all, all of this stuff. But at the end of the day, no art is made in a true bubble. You know, even, even mm-hmm. someone who's working completely in abstraction is, is being influenced by, the nature around them or the objects they have in their home or the colors that were available in their uh, box of paints. We're all influenced by things that are really, uh, you know, inconsequential, but end up becoming very important later on. Yeah. Yeah, like an example, it's like, although you you explicitly take from from meme, the meme world, but you're also creating them too. So there's this exchange, you know, I feel like it's like you're memifying things that aren't necessarily that. So I think it's a really interesting process. Yeah, there was a time where I was, um, I was really focused on even painting memes. There was a short time, I think in, in 2010, where I was yeah. literally finding interesting stills from youtube and painting them with the youtube bar at Mm -hmm. the bottom which is funny because we're broadcasting this on youtube right now um (laughs) and and, and then i started making memes for a long time once my my oldest daughter was first born and um i'm there there's a i there is some I, I do worry sometimes that I'm becoming like a culture vulture a little bit when I'm when I'm trying to paint these memes or doing things that's like internet or memery, even though like I, I, I feel like I'm part of the yeah, culture in many ways. But like I feel like fine art, there's a certain level of like, if I'm going to spend an hour or two making a painting of the X-Men's Cyclops, it's not going to have the same kind of uh, impact as someone photoshopping uh comic sans on a picture an embarrassing picture of their cousin it's not the same thing um 
<laughs> right. So I kind of pulled it away a little bit. I, I, I am self-aware, though, um, especially when it comes to, like, um, choosing things from my own childhood and nostalgia. I, I really... Yeah. I, I'm really <clears throat> drawn to that stuff, not just because it's from my childhood, because there's plenty of characters that I think are out now that I find super fascinating that I never even got to with this series, and I might even continue it on the side. Um, but I also feel like these are things that formed me, and also th some of the, these characters are great works of art in their own right. Um, yeah, for sure. But every once in a while, I'll look at, like, I'll go on the internet, and I'll, I, I started watching videos of uh, artists critiquing other artists, and I was like, oh, this is interesting. And there's this whole world of people who make original characters or they call them ocs where it's like you know it looks like a moody anime character and they kind of give you like a a trading card biography of them and i sat there going like i understand this this makes a lot of sense i just don't understand why anyone would do this like why invent your mm -hmm. own character are if you're not making a comic strip if you're not making a story with them what's the point and I realized, oh, no, I, I just yeah. I take a step back. I'm like, oh, no, they're doing exactly what I'm doing. It's just they want to do it on their own under their own terms. I mean, there are some that <laughs> some of this stuff touches the furry community, which is its own um, its own separate thing that I, I don't know enough to really get into. But like, you know, uh, I don't want to lose the plot. On this. Hold on a second. My brain stopped for a moment. Um, but like, you know, there's a. We're doing a call. Go ahead. Watch me. <laughs> Sorry, we had a we have a friend from in John just came in the door. <laughs> Didn't know where this was a this is a uh, social distancing gallery talk. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> so we're saying, Dave. I'm sorry. That like you know, there's this this stuff. This stuff kind of takes on its own life, and, and new rules are uh, created. And I'm I'm just trying to react to that as best I can. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that, uh, well, also I wanted to ask about the form of these, that uh, are these intentionally the size, it seems like the size of video game cartridges, you know, at least. Yeah, totally fine. So, uh, oh, I can see myself dancing. I gotta turn this on for a second. So I, uh, so it turns out that I plugged in the wrong laptop, and this thing didn't tell me that the battery was dying. So all of a sudden, it just turned off. <laughs> no. Oh no. So are we so are we live now? Uh, yeah, we're back live. I, I think I'm still okay. recording. If not, uh, it looks like everything is still going. I'm just gonna type tech. Okay. I can't tell. It's so small I can't see. See, the problem with this laptop is if I want the screen to actually face me, I can't read what, you know, text on white on this laptop, if I, that makes any sense. That, like, to get the contrast that I like, I have to turn it so that it's staring above my head. It's very, I don't know who designed this camera, did not do it right. But, um, where was I? Um, yeah, I think, like, oh, I don't even know where, where my influences are. I think a lot of it's pop art. And then I even added some of my art, artist influences in this show. Um, I mean, not, not Banksy or Mr. Uh, Brainwash by any stretch, but Steve Espo Powers is definitely an a, a influence of mine. Let me pause this. <laughs> So you can see me okay still? 
Yeah, it's vertical, I think, a little bit, but that's all right. I'm okay with that. Yeah, give me one sec. After all this, after all this testing, I, I, I'm foiled by not plugging in the right laptop cord. <laughs> right, after, after planning it and trying its stuff out, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it, you can't prepare for everything, right? No, I can't. I can't uh, well, that's the thing with technology. The, the most dangerous part is the people. <laughs> that's all the flaws rely on is the actual people themselves. There we go. I gotta bend this down again so I can see me. But yeah, like um, like a lot of my influences are like uh, Tom Sachs or um, yeah, Tom uh, Sachs. Yeah, yeah. But it's funny because I don't do a lot of Tom Sachsian stuff in my illustration work or my painting work. It, it's very much so more in my sculptural work. Yeah, right. Well, it's also you have that methodology or that mindset. I think it's different. It's not so much necessarily the uh, um, what you're doing. It's like the thought process. I think is what's interesting about Tom. Yeah, I you know, feel it's like, the, uh, yeah, I think there's like a real emphasis on using materials for um, the right the right materials for the right project and kind of the attitude of it all. Yeah, it's the, uh, I love the line, but I, I think about him a lot, where he says, paint first, then cut. <laughs> I like that. That's like, and that goes for a lot of things. That, can, that, that makes it, makes the, uh, the process uh, way more interesting to me. Oh, yeah, definitely. Because I also think that, like, in, in some ways with, like, fine art, even with this stuff that I'm doing, even if you want to call it, I wouldn't even call it lowbrow, um, mm -hmm. because I don't really... I don't know. I feel like I, I'm too well educated for this to be lowbrow. I feel like I would just kind of be like trying to pretend to be one of the cool kids mm -hmm. saying this is lowbrow, but like, this is like strong middlebrow stuff. I think like <laughs> middlebrow. I like that. Yeah, I think I think that's what I am. Like I I I can real I can talk a great game about highbrow art and lowbrow art. So I think I'm distinctly this kind of stuck me in the middlebrow. Well, that makes it makes you a good pop artist, right? So that's what pop is supposed to be. It's supposed to be cross cross uh, any kind of uh, like social status or education level. You know, supposed to be do like provide something for everybody. Absolutely, and 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 like, you know, I look at like uh like Garfield. You know, that's another one of those inspirations. Like I, or maybe reverse inspiration. Jim Davis is famous for like kind of just trying to make money off his character. Um, I always thought it was like, you know, it's really funny, the idea of like someone like uh, uh, the guy who did um, Calvin and Hobbes being really precious about the characters and really thought thoughtful about how... Right, uh, right, right. How he uh, composes them and then Garfield kind of being like, all right, well, we're going to just see how many different kinds of uh, merch we can come up with. And there's... As I'm sitting there watching a CGI version of Garfield the Cat with my children, I'm sitting there going, like, this is, like, the fourth time I've seen Garfield rebooted. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's something really interesting about uh, these are, like, these are brands or icons, you know, they how they have this weight that comes with them, and you can keep reusing that. And it's, I guess the familiarity of it is what makes it so... Uh, relatable to people you know there's like just the fact you've seen it so many times that you're immediately drawn to that which is a strange thing when you think about it right you know that why are we drawn to something we're always we're constantly seeing uh so what, what do you think about that well i think of like when i remember one time when when my wife was giving birth at the hospital we would go to this catholic hospital my wife's not catholic she's jewish and she's just like there are crosses everywhere I'm like, what? She goes, there are crosses everywhere. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess because it's a Catholic hospital. But because I've been around, I was raised Catholic, so the fact that there are crosses in every room didn't even, like, didn't even, I didn't pick up on it. I was just so used to that. Like, there were yeah, pictures yeah, yeah. of Jesus and Mary hanging above my grandmother's couch growing up. And it wasn't until later I was like, oh, that's Jesus. I just thought it was some... <laughs> you know, some guy. It's just like a form that keeps repeating itself, yeah. Yeah, it kind of, it, like, it makes an impact, but it's kind of in, like, the back of your head, you know? Yeah, and, yep. And then when you're, when you're an outsider or you put it, you reframe these things, you're like, oh, yeah, that is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm, mm 
Um, yeah, the Picasso one, I, 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 I don't, I love Picasso's work. I don't paint like Picasso at all, but I, I always, uh, like to tell my wife that I, I may not be a better painter than Picasso, but I'm a way better father. He would like paint and he'd leave his kids locked outside because he wouldn't hear them because he was so into what he was doing. <laughs> So when I'm feeling low about my work, I'm like, yeah, you know, but Picasso was not a good father and not a good family no. man. And like, and neither was uh, Darth Vader, right? Oh yes. <laughs> That's a bad dad right there too. I'm not going to say Picasso is nearly is as bad as Darth Vader. Um, because in some way, Darth Vader is a genocidal maniac. Although in, in, in reality, that's all pretend and, a pretend person can't right. kill you can't really kill other pretend people um but but, <laughs> but like i don't know darth vader I, I i the older i get the more i relate to him like oh man just like you know you gotta try and uh take it down a notch darth <laughs> <laughs> and also i found interesting is that there's two i think there's two instances where yeah where you reverse the form it's Picasso and, uh, you know, Friday the 13th. Oh, yeah, Jason <laughs> think, Right? Um, yeah, so I was doing, uh, I, I was thinking like, oh, all right, so since Mario jumps from bottom, top left to bottom right, I should have all the villains jump the other way. And then when I realized uh, I painted Picasso as a villain and I didn't do Darth Vader as a villain, I was like, uh, maybe I, maybe this is too deep. <laughs> of a concept um but my idea was i was going to try changing it up but again that's that's the idea of like coming up with a structure and then messing around with the structure and playing with it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i mean i love i love the friday the 13th the first friday the 13th movie um i went to summer camp where they filmed that movie oh yeah in mean, blairstown yeah yeah and uh I, sw I did the mile swim in that lake uh, a lot of those places where they got murdered, I spent nights camping. It's like you know, it's a, that's a big part of my childhood. So I was like, oh I yeah, I, I live I lived in Blairstown for a good amount of time. I went to elementary school there, and it was Friday Thirteenth was like was this. It was like the one shining thing in that town. <laughs> you know that it was like, and also I think it was like that and Hope, like Hope, New Jersey, and Blairstown both had connections to uh to Friday Thirteenth. So they played that really, you know, that's one of those, it's like going to the, the, uh, the, the Seaside Heights and seeing the Jersey Shore stuff. There's Jersey you know, Shore that. stuff at Seaside Heights? <laughs> like the, 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 it was just, yeah, and uh, just steeped in the Friday 13th lore and living in that town. Oh my gosh. See, uh, I always thought of Blair's Tank because when I, when I would go up to Nobi Bosco, like I always thought of it as being like this cute little town. Like, I never even thought of it as being, because I don't even think when I went there until the very last couple of years, I didn't even think I even recognized it as being the Friday the 13th. Right. Because I'd never seen that movie. And I was like, and then I was looking at the, 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 because my wife had the DVD and I, and I was looking at the DVD going, oh, right. The, the sign for the Camp Crystal Lake was hanging in the trading post at Novi Bosco for decades. Oh, I right. I, I don't know if it was original or what, but I'm like, and it was just like, again, like the, like the, like the, 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 uh, the crucifix. It was just like, this is just so part of the scenery that I didn't notice it, but yet it made it seep its way into my brain. Yeah. It's like the background murmur, you know, that's like ever present. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, so, and I know that talking about villains, I noticed the the different, you have, uh, it, see, it seemed like to me you had a series of villains and heroes. That's funny you brought that up because it wasn't made explicit. So I had them, I, I hung them across from each other. So I had the villains over here and then the heroes facing them. So I made, I made the paintbrush a hero because it's a hero to me, so. <laughs> Oh, well, that's, I mean, that's one of the later ones where you could tell that I'm really trying to mess around with the form. 
Um, <laughs> but you could argue that 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 uh, that Scott, the Cyclops Scott Summers is actually a villain, and uh, right. And I, and I love I love uh, Wolverine and and Ghost Rider because they're anti heroes in many right. in many senses of the word, but. Which I, I always gravitated as a kid to, and as an adult, I'd be like, I would not want to hang out with them at all. They'd be like the worst. They would be like planning <laughs> a movie all the time and just be ready to fight. And I'm like, I'm just too chill for that nowadays. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, I was like, for a while, I was like, oh yeah, look, I can't do them all the same way. I got to switch it up. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and then can you talk about the distinction between using characters and then also, like, quote-unquote, real people? Yeah, so, like, um, the one on the left here is Jane Goodall. Um, I guess I'd call her field biologist Jane Goodall and environmental activist. And uh, mm-hmm. I, I recently read a book with my with my girls, actually, and my son, too, and I'm talking about he, he was there, too, uh, all about the story of Jane Goodall. And I was like, oh, she's a very interesting person person um and i i thought like oh i should highlight i think i was making these during march or women's history month and i was thinking like how could i incorporate um some historical figures into this and kind of play yeah. around with the idea of heroes and important and, and, and highlighting important people like because i'm highlighting these characters that are important to me but like really billy jean king uh the the uh, tennis player did way f- more important work by you know trying trying to lay the groundwork for female athletes than wolverine did he's not even a real <laughs> character um, and, and the more you learn about billie jean king like even though you might say well you know she isn't as well remembered nowadays and you get like venus and serena williams Nowadays, right. who are really tearing it up, and women, but the only reason I think women's tennis gets paid the same amount as men's tennis players, like the, the, their actual salaries are comparable. Where in every other, yeah. every other industry, especially in the sports, it's not the same because mm-hmm. of Billie Jean King's activism and her ex- proving that, like, no, I can, I can beat a man. This is not, this has nothing to do with me being a woman. Um, right, right. And I, and I find that like. As as a man who teaches, like I'm in a in, in a quote unquote traditional women, woman's field, um, I really appreciate her kind of like putting herself out there to uh, to really change the world for better and like make actual change. I mean, the fact that we're in 2020 yeah. and women pay, get paid like 70 to 75 percent of what men get paid for the same or comparable jobs is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. And you're right. It's very, it's very interesting how tennis is, is the outlier in that. And I really, I appreciate that. I played tennis in high school and I very much love tennis. My whole family loves tennis. And I remember hearing about Billie Jean King. Um, and it's funny, like, I, I don't remember even the, the guy that she beat. <laughs> it's like, it's, uh, there, there is that match between the, where she, she faced uh, another professional tennis player. And do you remember the, the guy that she she played? If you asked by me chance? a month ago, I probably would have remembered. I can't now. Yeah. So that's funny. Like, there's there's case in point. You know, like we only remember her. You know, and that's really profound. You know, in in that in that match because she well, a she won right, and you know b she's an amazing player, and so there's a you know that that, that, that means a lot. Well, it's it's like the uh, the the thought of that like women in the United States have only had only had the vote for like a hundred years. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. the, the idea that like, there's all this, I mean, a lot of it comes from the logic that like, well, men had to support families, so they should be paid more, but we see it more and more where women are having to support their own children and, and or families are taking on different shapes and, and sizes. And, and, and that it's like th- th- this argument holds no water. But yet we're right. still okay with it. It's just kind of funny to me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if is Wangari Mathai in, in this show too. I don't know if I finished that one. The one again? The, uh, the Wangari Mathai. She's dressed as an African. I might have given that one to my daughter. <laughs> That's she, good. She, well, uh, I'll go. 
I'll pan over to the to the quote unquote real side. I have well, I have obviously like Stalin and Mao together because you need to be. They're all you know, they have... real. <laughs> so you got... Oh yeah, here, right here. Wangari Mathai was a. Uh, yeah. She was a. Um... Oh my gosh, I should know this. I want to say you got. I... I'm going to say Nigerian. I can't remember now. She was an environmental activist and and, uh, for, and an activist for women's education. And um, she ended up planting thousands of trees in Africa and, and changing the climate of her country be, w- with efforts. And, and it's funny because like, she lived in a time where it was like women weren't accompanied by men could be like beaten by the police. And she managed mm-hmm. to like move to the u.s get educated and then move back to try and change her country for the be- for the better i have a i have a real affinity for wangari matai because when uh my my oldest daughter did uh what they call a uh, a wax museum project at her school uh-huh. she she went as wangari matai and if you you've met my daughter she's a uh a young white girl with uh with brown hair so she she wore like <laughs> a uh she made a headband that looked like this. No, she wore a bandana that she tied in the front and she wore a dress that matched the pattern. And she carried around a, a little tree in a pot that I made her. And I was like, mm-hmm, Oh, mm-hmm. that's it. That's what you're doing. You're just in imitate her dress. And then you're going to tell everyone all about this important female, uh, female activist. And I was just like, yeah, wonderful. Yeah. I was like, Oh, that was a very proud parenting moment for me. You know, yeah, which uh, I always found it was funny because, like, you, you went to the school and there was like a whole room of Abraham Lincoln's. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I guess it's easy. That's an easy icon to use, right? Talking about icons, you know that with Abraham Lincoln, you have a beard and a hat, and that's that's basically you got it. And he's not so, a bad guy, and, you know. It's not like you find out all this stuff later that oh, Lincoln did all this terrible stuff too. Like he, he uh, basically fought to emancipate people from slavery i mean and died for it you know you can't really fault a guy for that mm-hmm. no not at all you know i think that that's he more or less you know has done good things <laughs> right yeah i think we can all agree abraham lincoln seemed like a pretty decent guy <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna put myself out there yeah right. So it's, we're not going to really go out. You're not going out on a limb by saying that. Oh, and I, I uh, and I recognize him uh, treating Native Americans totally unfairly, uh, but also like, right. you know, he didn't survive his pre- uh, his presidency. So I'll just say he paid the price. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. That's for sure. Yeah, and you have uh, Espo. Oh yeah, uh, next Steve. To- Steve Espo Powers, uh, one of the um, beautiful losers, was what mm-hmm. he, the group was called with, like, Barry McGee and uh, Margaret Kilgallen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and uh, which is funny because he was yeah, not really... Uh, right? So... Yeah, he... he um, I, it, it's funny because, like, um, like, I'm not, I, I'm not a graffiti guy like i put up a couple things but not with spray paint just like glue ups here and there and, and most of the stuff i ever put up fell down <laughs> so whatever um uh and i i, I may put a few stickers up there before but but uh steve powers is like a reformed graffiti writer who then became a street artist and um he recently did uh i guess it's not that recent but a, a year or so ago he did a mural in our in my town and I got to meet him, and I was just like, wow, he's, like, exactly what I would expect. Like, he was nicer than I expected. He was, like, very forthcoming with talking to me. He was willing to talk. He and his assistant were real nice guys. He actually bought pizza for me and another guy. He's like, oh, I went to go get lunch. You guys want a slice of pizza? And I'm like, sure, why not? Uh, very lovely person. Um I would usually say don't meet your heroes, but Steve Powers is fine. You can talk to him. He's a good conversationalist. Very mm-hmm. interesting person. And also, he, he's been a big influence on my work because he uses a lot of uh, clear and, and lines, and he uses a lot of... Uh, he draws a lot of his inspiration quite literally from if he's doing a work, uh, a, a mural in a town, he'll take inspiration from the 
block or so area around the town. Um, he did a lot of work that kind of was inspired by the idea of commuting because Metuchen is like a, a real commuter town and we have a train station and stuff. Um, and there is has been some controversy around his work too, which I find um, utterly hilarious because I find his work, <laughs> for the most part, really un... Uh, it's not controversial. It's uncontroversial, but whatever. But, you know, there's people can always find something to complain about. And I'm not even saying that they're wrong. I think sometimes that people are right to complain about stuff, but it's funny that even he, he gets complaints too. Um, yeah, as, let's see who else is up there. But, yeah, I, I, I had a lot of fun painting that. That's a picture of him jumping outside the studio. Well, I think it's a, it's a good time to talk about, like, I mean, we're kind of touching on it, but your what is your, like, current worldview about the arts? You know, how do you feel about the arts as it's developing? And especially now, you know, like, given this new kind of paradigm we're living in. Well, I mean, it's weird because in some ways I would deem the arts as non-essential. Like, here we go. Here's a meme painting right there. There's Big Chungus. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, well, but it literally is a meme made from a, a, a short clip from an old uh, Looney Tunes cartoon where B Bugs Bunny's making fun of Elmer Fudd, and then people turned him into his own separate character. Um, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, Big Chungus. Like, that's hilarious. Know, just <laughs> yeah, and that, this is like a fairly new... This is a new meme, right? So it's been it's not been around for long. Uh, probably about a year at most. Yep. Even though the clip is easily from like the forties or fifties, like which I find really <laughs> funny, um, but now, like I don't know. I, I in some ways the arts are non-essential, right? I'm not keeping anyone alive with my paintings, but in many other ways, this is the kind of thing that people need right now to kind of stay focused and realize why we're uh, social distancing and why we're trying to. Um, keep ourselves sane which is what exactly what my art does it helps me keep sane um yeah like well whenever i, I hear that argument about like the what's what's essential or non-essential about for example like the arts you know think about this this churchill quote about they asked they asked him like why are you trying to save these artworks in the middle of war and he said something to the effect of like well what are we fighting for so I think that that's a really profound comment. He's like, we're, we're, we're fighting to save these things because they're important to him. <laughs> so so these, uh, does, that, does that make sense to you? Absolutely. And I, and I think like this is the stuff that makes life worth living. Um, I'm not saying my paintings, but I mean art in general. <laughs> well, more or less. Uh, you know, like you, you probably you don't need uh, a, a Loch Ness monster. I'm not, sorry, Loch Ness monster. A creature from the Black Lagoon painting on your wall to really feel fulfilled. Um, but if you want to, they're available for sale. <laughs> like, they will improve your life at least a little bit. Um, That's right. But like, but but if you don't have art, then you know whether it's movies or music or visual art or games. Like, all this stuff is the things we use to uh, occupy our brains that take us out of our everyday existence and struggle. I mean, that's, I mean, whenever you see culture start to, you know, get comfortable, that's when people start really producing art. But also when people are yeah. feel under duress, they'll make, you know, protest art. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and also, how do we know about any, any culture beyond our own? You know, it's through their artwork. You know, we don't, we can't talk to them directly, right? Oh, so, yeah. so that's the other. What, what makes it very? Uh, I find it problematic to say like something's like that's not essential. And so, but how would you know about anything at all? <laughs> so, so without some without the culture's artwork, you know, how do we know anything about you know any piece of history, right? Exactly. Um, and and if, if nothing else, even if it doesn't tell you about their culture per se, it does say something about what they found important because usually <laughs> cultures make artwork about the things they find that are important. Um, you know, that's how we live in a culture that, you know, uh, finds 
reality TV important. That's how we end up voting in a president who, you know, is basically a game show host. Yeah, <laughs> right, more or less, yeah. Um, and, and, and some of these characters are the kinds of characters that I, I feel like are, are the things that are going to um, are really kind of stand the test of time. Like Oscar the Grouch is a really interesting character. He's essentially a homeless person who lives on the street, right. but he's not like, I mean, he, and he's really sour. He's not always positive. He's kind of grouchy, but he's an important part of the neighborhood. You know, like he oh, is an oh, important oh. character to the fabric of Sesame street. And without him, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't really feel like New York, although it feels more gentrified nowadays, but, um, oh, oh. But like you know, that's essentially what what he is. He's a, he's essentially like a, a homeless character that is basically made to be kind of safe. He doesn't have any real mental issues. He's not fighting addiction. He's just like he lives outside. He is who he is. You don't want to try and change him, but you know you you don't exclude him from things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It feels like he's kind of like a. The Diogenes, you know, of Sesame Street. <laughs> yeah. So we, um, in my house, we've been watching a lot of uh, Shalom Sesame, which is, um, it's a mix between the American Sesame Street and the Israeli Sesame Street. Oh. I don't remember what the Israeli Sesame Street is. It's something Zoom Zoom, which is basically Sesame Seed in um, Rehoboth Zoom Zoom. I don't know. I can't remember what it, what it is. But um, it basically means Street of the Sesame. Um, uh -huh. and, uh, the, the Oscar, the grouch character there is called Moishe Ufnik. Uh -huh. And basically he's like a, a burgundy, um, a burgundy, uh, grouch who lives in a recycling bin who I find hilarious because he's got this really oh. thick Israeli accent. Uh, <laughs> recycling bin. <laughs> And he's like, oh, I you know, he's just like, he's like Oscar the Grouch, but he's like, he just sounds like more like an old man than Oscar the Grouch does to me, because he's got that really heavy Israeli accent, which I find really funny. And it wasn't until <laughs> I discovered Moshe Ufnik, I'm like, oh yeah, I guess Oscar the Grouch is an important character. There's no Cookie Monster version that I can think of. And, <laughs> and, and they don't have a big bird, they have um, a giant hedgehog. Huh. Uh, Why do you think that is? Um, I don't know. I, I'm not really totally sure. He's got an adorable voice, they, though. An adorable right, Why would they take away a character? <laughs> what's, what's the purpose of that? I think he's kind of like a childlike character who's big and fun to watch. Like, I haven't watched a lot of the original uh, Israeli um, Sesame Street, but because the Sholem Sesame is actually, a, it's a mix of American characters and Israeli characters, and it's literally designed to teach kids about the J Jewish high holy days and the Jewish holidays. Uh huh. Oh, oh, I see. I gotcha. It's an educational tool. Oh yeah, totally. Um, yeah. The uh, well, what I love about the the Cookie Monster one is that it's like the cookies have become the architecture. You know, they have like the manhole looks like manhole cover. And the fence are also made out of cookies. So it's like you're seeing through the eyes of the cookie monster. <laughs> like, this is how he sees the world, right? Yeah, I was really so thinking it's... about, like, oh, I was going to do, because Big Bird, you can see the back, it kind of looks like Sesame Street. It's inspired yeah. by the architecture of the show. And I was like, oh, this cookie monster has got a weird view of things. I, I, I really should make it, like, almost cookie like. <laughs> And all right, because like I think to me some of the most important parts of like the most artistic parts of like the Super Mario games are the backdrops. The level design mm -hmm. is really important. Like the character design, actually, I feel like is a lot less important than the level design is. That's why a lot of my um, my illustrations, like here of Mister Brainwash, has like the clouds yeah. in the background. It's kind of that Mario esque. Um, yeah, yeah. And they control V. <laughs> oh, yeah, because he's just copying and pasting. He's not even, I'm sorry, he's not copying and pasting. He's paying some graduate student <laughs> to copy and paste for him. 
<laughs> Let me take my half cooked idea and you cook it up and make it look good and then I'll sell it for hundreds of dollars in a limited series. <laughs> yeah, the uh, I love the, I love the goon, the goon series. You know, first like literally the lagoon goon and then the the goons one through, you know, three or four. You're in there to uh, Banksy, right? Yeah, I don't know if I put is Steve Powers one of the art goons, is that? I don't yeah, I don't think uh I don't think that was part of it. Oh, no, it's, yeah, Banksy's definitely, because I was like, oh, I'll do Mr. Brainwash because he's got those mutton chops. And I was like, oh, you know, I got, that'll be definitely, um, that'll definitely uh, translate well into illustration. Um, though for a while, I was really trying to buy one of those Banksy masks, and they're not cheap. Like, <laughs> I found one for like hundreds yeah. of dollars. Yeah, and I just recently saw the, this post by Banksy about him just paint, like doing work in his bathroom, and it says like his wife hates it when he's you know stuck home, and it's just like rats like everywhere all over his bathroom, like, messing around with stuff. I was like, that's really brilliant. So even even in this, like he's still work, still working inside. He still can do that. <laughs> yeah, I find him to be a fascinating character. Like I don't I don't know if I even think of him as being a great artist as much as I think he's like, or, or a great graffiti artist or painter as much as he's a really good conceptual artist. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I feel like the concepts and the ideas are way more interesting than the actual work itself. Yeah, and I, 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 I can, I, I agree with that certainly. I think that he, as he uses graffiti as a tool for his conceptual work, you know, it's like it's a thing that he, and that's, that's what makes it so distinct, you know, that 99% of graffiti is is a very specific kind of thing. You know, and when you look at a Banksy, you're not, you know, it seems like distinct that there's something else. It may not be like a, a, a part of the graffiti language, but it's something else. Yeah, well, shout out to our friend Joe Castronova. Um, yeah, yeah, there we go. He, yeah, he's, he does like that, yeah. yeah he like we, takes graffiti and makes it something else. Yeah, well, I'll just say for Joe's sake, I'll give my theory that uh, that for a long time I thought that uh, Banksy was Black the Rat, who is a uh, a graffiti artist from uh, a graffiti artist from uh, France, who uh. Uh, who does similar stencil rats all over Paris, I believe. So for a long uh -huh. time, everyone's like, "Oh, I bet it's the same guy," although I'm pretty uh. sure. Banksy's a, actually a British national. Oh look, Shrouded Hand, one of my favorite YouTubers, is now in, also in the um, in the feed as well. Oh, right on. Um, so, um, yeah, I think like for me, um, I don't know. Part of me is like always dreams about like being an artist full time. Even though I, I, I think at this point in my life, I realize now that that would probably be a very bad idea because I think I would just be like <laughs> bored. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but uh, part of me wants to really like, um, I kind of play with this idea in the mind. The, I'm really interested in like how artists kind of start their career and how they do the work they do, like how they, um, how they uh, like get to where they are. Yeah. Speaking of artists, why don't you go? Oh, I can. Oh, I can put my mouse in the video feed. I didn't even realize. Go back. I want to. I want to look at the Pablo Escobar one. If you can go back to that one. Sure. Because once I did Pablo Picasso, I was like, oh, I should do Pablo Escobar as well. <laughs> Pablo. Yeah. Um. I mean that that guy's a nightmare, clearly. Um, <laughs> but. No, I don't want you on on camera. Sorry, Rose. I don't care. Okay. Uh, if you don't know who Pablo Escobar was, he was basically a, a, a multinational drug dealer. And there's little rhinos, or no, hippos in the picture, because um, you can barely see them. There, Because one of the side effects of his uh, great wealth in, in, uh, in Medellin is um, he had his own little private zoo. And eventually what happened was when he died and they kind of closed down all of his stuff... Um, the side effect was there have like these now feral hippos in Colombia that are left over uh -huh. from like one of his personal zoos. So even now to this day, one of the most dangerous animals in the world is just running around the 
mountains of Colombia because some guy decided he wanted to get a bunch for <laughs> to show off to his kids. Oh yeah, yeah, they're very they're very dangerous and like they're they're <laughs> so but they don't like they don't seem like this especially in this drawing it seems like a, a silly creature right but they're definitely very very vicious. Oh yeah, they kill more people than like bears do because they don't yeah. see well and they're very territorial and they're enormous. Mm -hmm. But though, yeah. if you get a chance, anyone watching this, you should go check out uh, Zay Frank's uh, Opie videos, the reverse hippo, mm -hmm. where it's basically just he pretends that, that hippos walking in reverse are different animals called Opies, and it's like the funniest thing I've seen in a really long time. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, I don't want to ruin the part where they watch the Opie eat, but it's pretty <laughs> disgusting and hilarious. I love it. Yeah, and also, like, I've noticed that there's, like, can you talk about, so you have, like, ver you have a couple of versions of, of certain ones, like, you have a couple of Maos, you got a couple of Vaders, so what's the process of, like, making one or, or multiples, like, how do you deal with that? Seems like it's mainly singular, but well, it seems like you got a few more. One of my inspirations right now um, is this artist called The Suck Lord, who is a, uh, a toy maker who lives in Chinatown in New York City, and he... Um, he makes action figures, and he does it by taking parts of old action figures and old toys and remixing them to make brand new characters. And he designs huh? not only the, the, the figures, um, but he also designs the backing boards. And um, I think that's where I kind of got the idea of like using Star Wars, like the iconography of Star Wars in my artwork, because that's something that he does, he's really famous for. Um, uh -huh. And his work is really inspirational. Uh, I mean, his his work can get a lot more risque than my work does, by a long shot. Um, but uh, his his action figure work, it's it's very rare that you can buy artwork from uh, a living artist who's like who I know is going to be one of those people who really kind of transcends uh, the like his his genre of like bootleg art toys and i was doing resin figures for a while and i might get back uh -huh. to that yeah. later on um but um but i so i was trying to use some of my my heroes uh inspirations in my own work so uh mal zedung was something that that andy warhol used a lot in his work because of the use of iconography in the um in the communist, uh, I, I got what we call it the the Cultural Revolution. Um, I mean, look, uh, Mao Zedong was a maniacal megalomaniac who probably set China back for decades, and 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 now I feel like China's really only starting to recover. Yeah, and, and in some ways, it still has a lot of this, a lot of problems because of his legacy. But you look at him; he's just like this, like you know, he looks like a old cat. I don't know. I, I just find him very interesting character. <laughs> right. And, and like, um, like whether or not you 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 see yourself as someone who's like. Some, you know, socialist or sympathetic to socialism, or or a uh, or a capitalist or whatever. Like he's still a very interesting character, um, which is also why I I, I did um, Stalin because mm -hmm. Stalin is another one yeah. of those uh, readers who really mastered iconography mm -hmm. and propaganda in his lifetime. And it's funny, you really you didn't have to change much in the Mario because of just how he already looks. Yeah. <laughs> I just I just saw my dad in the chat and, and he'll attest that his older brother looks a lot like Super Mario and a little bit like Stalin. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, but yeah, I just read something about his daughter, uh, who came to the United States and was not a supporter of her father and just she passed away like not that long ago. I forget where, but it was really interesting. Uh, there's like this this channel on YouTube. It's like the, called the History Guy, where she went into into depth about her life and 
living in the United States and being, you know, Stalin's daughter, you know, she did, she took, obviously she wasn't, her name wasn't Stalin. She kind of like gave that up, but um, it's really interesting stuff. Yeah. I mean, this painting, I really tried to make it like the, um, the uh, Russian propaganda at the time. Um, the, the, uh, cause there's a huge collection where we went to school in, at the Zimmerly Museum. Yeah. Oh, uh, realism. Of, of yeah. The, yeah. The Russian nonconformist stuff. Um, right, and some of that artwork is some of my main inspirations even to this day. I yeah, really love that. Really, yeah, the Zimmerli. Shout out to the Zimmerli, right? You know, it's really there's some. It's a really great uh, collection of at the Dodge Foundation, right? That was it's, really yeah, it, it's amazing, and, and uh, I, I try and go there a few times a year. I really love that museum. I probably go there more than I go to the Met. Like it's so good. Yeah. Oh no, it's and it's right here, you know, right in New Brunswick. So really good stuff. But like, um, yeah, like yeah, this this would fit right into that exhibit. This <laughs> the super style one, I feel. Oh yeah, totally. Um, like, I mean, I wonder if they. I know, I know, Tetris came out of Russia. I wonder if Mar Super Mario made it its way in. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. It's a good question. Yeah, like I don't know. I I found I've always found the iconography of like villains kind of interesting. Like you see a lot mm -hmm. of people who are really into like, you know, people who dress up like stormtroopers and like dress up like Darth Vader or the Joker and Harley Quinn. Like these are not these were not written to be like laudable characters. They're mm -hmm. meant to be the bad guys, but people are still drawn to them. Um, I mean, I think I think some characters are stronger than the other. Uh, others i i'm definitely stop i need you to stop thank you <laughs> sorry as a parent for a little bit um children aren't they really our greatest artwork yeah. you gotta be a space at some points yeah I, I again so the more the older i get the more i relate to uh darth vader <laughs> But like I, I really like. Um, but Stalin really understood iconography. He would like, he would Photoshop people out of photos and make them disappear, to be, almost <laughs> like to to make them like never have they existed, like erase their history if they either crossed him or disappointed him or whatever. Like I think he did that with Trotsky too. Like it just. Oh yeah, very sinister. Oh yeah, <laughs> I remember seeing a series of photographs as he was getting rid of people like it started very large and then the the, the crowd was was large at first and very small at the end of the editing <laughs> yeah. with him and Ugh, they did, that idea is just really frightening to me which is why i think his his iconography always kind of stuck with me as well mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's I make a I make a point of uh, if I bring someone to the the Dodge Foundation is that you see like if you see this work that's up uh, that that means that these artists like literally risk their lives to make these things because he would have no qualms about killing these people for making this degenerate artwork, right? Oh yeah. So and and and, and the scariest part is that one of the one of the best displays is the the artist notebook that kind of mm -hmm. that basically this this guy was uh, i don't remember the name of the artist which is sad i should know that but like they were basically put into an artist gulag and they were then taken to basically create the propaganda and it just talks about the conditions and like the hierarchy and the the abuse between and two prisoners under the communist rule and it's just like frightening that just because yeah. you don't you don't um you don't agree with someone's uh politics that you're able to just treat them like n not like people it's just really yeah scary. well it also showed again like how you know it's it's interesting how how he viewed art as this he he thought it was very important and powerful you know so it was so powerful that he would kill people because they weren't making the right kind of art you know, so that says a lot about what art can do for culture and how the importance and like the severity, you know, the, even even Stalin, you know, I mean, all the all the leaders during that period were were trying to save like 
their culture and Western culture and and largely it was artwork, you know, and and that's was a motivator. Yeah, in a lot of ways they um, they're even like something like the Amber Room. There was a room that was that was supposed to, uh, supposedly made of all of amber that was lost. It was uh, created by the czars and. No one really even knows where it is now. It was literally disassembled and packed away and then stolen. You know, there's and, wow. And some people think that it's possible that it, the room being made of all amber had some other kind of like pheno- like some kind of electrical phenomenon created with it, like that it was somehow huh. some kind of weapon. Oh wow! So I also think a lot of these leaders, especially like Hitler, was really into the occult. Um, yeah. Like, uh, I I think to them, like, it wasn't just the the power of the message, but also these objects might have had their own power as well that they were trying to harness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I feel like with Stalin and with uh, Mao, that that power was not an abstract idea. It was definitely very literal. (laughs) (laughs) Yep, yep. You got the red eyes. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what. I'm assuming he had black eyes, but I gave him red eyes because of communism. <laughs> That's right. Well, I mean, are there, uh, since I can't see the stream, are there any questions or any comments made yet at the uh, from the uh, from the viewership? Um, no, but there are some great. Oh, there are comments definitely. Uh, Shrouded hand says my my art is cool. That's great. Thank you to all my favorite YouTubers for uh, stroking my ego. My father says he love hit, loves hippos, uh, but I know for a fact he does not like communism. Uh, let's see, who else? Uh, Christopher Brown says that he loves cults. So do I. Um, um, I'm really I, know, I know he does. He's a fan. Yeah, I'm really into learning about cults. There's, no, there's nothing more interesting to me than hearing the downfall of someone because of their own hubris. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh. and, and there's like no greater story than someone who is like born into one of these situations and uh, uh, finds their way out. I find those stories so inspiring. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, is my cup a hippo? No, my cup is a frog. This is my frog cup. I can't, I can't see your your picture, so. Oh no, I'm showing it to the um, I'm showing it to the the stream. <laughs> Very good. Excellent. Um, my work reminds Shrouded Hand of David Shrigley. Oh yeah, I, I love the the humor in it. Wait, so who who is it again? David Shrigley. Oh yeah, I'm not familiar. What's he like? Um, he does a lot of like text based artwork and very simple, um, cartoony stuff that is very very bitingly funny. He's a British painter. I think I'm saying this name right. Um, he was one of my favorite interviews on the Bad at Sports podcast years ago. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, lo- his, he is so smart. I'll send you some links <laughs> of stuff. Um, I kind of think of him as like, you know, he's not as technically good as like technically his work isn't as technically attractive as Banksy's, but it's like uh, way, way funnier to me. <laughs> and uh, Love that. Christopher asks, "There's no Tiger King pieces." Uh, uh, I have not. You know what? I, I admittedly I have not seen Tiger King. Have you? Okay, so no, I have not seen the Netflix series. I am listening to the Joe Exotic podcast. Uh, that was done by this Wondery, I think. Um, and th- it's all about Joe Exotic and the, t- the Tiger King. But there's a really good YouTube video by Primink. It was from like a year or two ago, all about uh, the Tiger King's YouTube channel. Um, and, and, and in the immortal words of Don King, only in America. Only in America. <laughs> Could a guy... Yeah, that- yeah. I know very little about the series, and I just, I, oh, I, I just, you can't avoid it now. Like, there's all these like memes and things pop up, and like you, you get bits and pieces of it. But yeah, I have not seen the actual show yet. 
but I, 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 I probably need to, to be a good pop culture person. So I will dig in at some point. Uh, yeah. You, you, it, it, it's, um, it's not like a heady documentary series or anything like mm-hmm. that. And I think it's probably not for the faint of heart because there is some like animal abuse in it because oh, okay. most Intr- of oh, the boy. people in this documentary are terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the exception of uh, one character, character, this is an actual person named Saf who loses his arm to a tiger and then goes back Whoa. to work. Um, and I say his because I, I think throughout the, the it's a uh, Saf is a transgender man who identifies as a man and is misgendered like the entire documentary from what I'm told. <laughs> um, also, probably the only character with like more than one or two redeeming qualities. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, at least of all the characters that I came across in the um, in in the later uh, in the in the um, I don't know what you're talking about, Rose. Sorry. Oh, she's playing Pokemon Go while I'm sitting here. Hope you're not affecting my uh, my stream here. No, we're good. Excellent connection what what is the uh do you know what like the i even know what it is really what is the overview of that that show like what is tiger king oh it's like uh it's a it's a it's a story of of a bunch of people who own private zoos in oklahoma and florida okay uh, i see and basically how cra- how crazy it is and how uh and, and how crazy these char- the character it's really character based. You really need to watch it for the characters in the story. I don't want to ruin anything for anyone who plans on watching oh, it. One of the yeah. <laughs> Since it was brought up, I just go I'm kinda of curious. Yeah, but like I don't know, I personally feel like um exotic animal people are always a little bit crazy. Um, mm-hmm. and you know, 'cause I feel like there's there's a there's a certain I, I think animals make people a little bit nuts like they you know like <laughs> like and i'm saying this as a cat owner like i treat my like, cat like a roommate like he is basically a tiny creature i let live in my house and i let him scratch me and then i feed him like that's <laughs> nuts. But, but any any negative any positive thing you can say about pet owners because you know they do have a lot of a lot of empathy which i think is good but i i think like exotic pet owners a lot of that empathy is lost and i think sometimes they're more like animal hoarders than they are like animal companions yeah, right. <laughs> so but like like one fact you learn on the show that I, I just learned through the podcast that there are more tigers in texas than there are out in the wild right uh-huh. because people are breeding these tigers to to you know pet in like petting zoos as babies and then they're putting these weird roadside um, roadside zoos that they really don't belong in. Yeah, that's for sure. Like, I think of all the people I know who have dogs and, like, how much care goes into taking care of this small animal who has been bred to be around people and is naturally inclined to be around people. Now, triple or quadruple the size of that animal and make it wild and very dangerous and not suited to being around large groups of people. And, and a lot of the people aren't stable. Who own them? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and and the, uh, this is actually, I, I know that this is a meme, but what is, what is the Joe Boomer meme with Snoopy? Like, what's, what's the connection? Um, I really or what's like, that about? I really like Peanuts. Um, I really like the Peanut car- the comics. I, um, and Snoopy, uh, particularly, I think, kind of transcends. Like the Peanuts comics themselves are all about um, about Charles Schultz's view of himself and relationships, but Snoopy kind of kind of spun out to be his own kind of separate character. And one of the characters yeah. Snoopy also is is Joe Cool, where he'd wear a sweater. It says Joe Cool, and he wears these sunglasses. Oh. Right. And I was like, oh, but it's funny because, like, Joe Cool is really a character who is probably older than my father, really, because it, it was written by 
someone my grandfather's generation really charles schultz would have been 100 probably yep. at this point um so i wrote joe boomer on it because i was like because there's all this talk about like um the word boomer possibly being like a slur i'm like it's really people got to relax about this stuff um yeah right and I'm saying this as a millennial because it turns out I'm ruining everything somehow. But uh, so the, yeah, it was kind of an idea, especially because I have a follower on Instagram who is probably a little older than my parents, and she posts a lot of Snoopy stuff. I was like, oh yeah, I guess like Snoopy's like a real. It's kind of old even for us. I, was, I think a lot, I had a lot of Snoopy stuff as a kid, but it was really like a throwback kind of thing was really designed for people my parents age the baby boomers that's right oh, that makes sense now as my father says yeah. it sounds like you had a wonderful childhood yes i did have a wonderful <laughs> childhood. oh that's terrific but this is one of the, the the super squash is one of the first in the oh, I love it. um I, I have a real interest in cryptozoological animals um Cryptozoology is the study of um, of animals that have not been. Oh, I, thought I lost Frank for a second. That 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 may or may not exist. Oh, I did lose Frank, but I'm still gonna go. I'm still gonna talk um, because I think my stream the quality. Yeah, my stream is still good. Uh, cryptozoology is the study of uh, animals that may or may not exist. Oh, you're back. Good. Um, okay, so yeah, did I lose you? Yeah, just for like a couple seconds, but you're back. And we never lost the stream. So. Oh, okay. So Super Squash was the first one in this series, I think, because I've been trying to work on a whole series of like cryptozoological animals. Um, uh -huh. Animals that may or may not exist or animals that are hidden, basically, is where the word comes from. Like Sasquatch and the Jersey Devil and... Um, like, but, but uh, cryptozoology is not a real science because the people who study cryptozoology are often people who faith-based believe in that these animals exist um, and aren't, don't actually take a scientific approach. However, there are animals like um, the panda was technically a cryptozoological animal or the, uh, even like the Komodo dragon were cryptozoological animals because for a long time scientists didn't believe that they actually existed until they finally discovered them. Uh. And and it wouldn't matter that local people were like, yeah, these animals live in the... They're like, oh, no, you're, you're making this up. This is like a tall tale. Um, but, so, I'm, I, I don't believe that, that Sasquatch or Bigfoot exists. I want him to exist, but I don't really think he <laughs> does. I think it's more likely that, like... Um, it's probably some kind of other animal that has some kind of genetic issue or physical malformality that lives out in the in the woods. But like you know, there's a whole lore, and that could be its own series dealing with Sasquatch. Part part of this is also I started my own um, club on Instagram called the uh, Cryptozoological uh, Drawing Club. Oh yes, right. The yeah, Cryptid Drawing Club, and I haven't really been keeping up with it. I might get back to it now, but it's a little hard because I feel like work is taking up so much time. But um, I was originally going to do like a Jersey Devil one and a, and a Sasquatch one, which is where I got the inspiration for the Tilly one. I was like, I didn't make a Jersey Devil one. I might as well, might as well make a useless Tilly. Um, who yeah. Is the uh, unofficial, um, probably the semi-official uh, logo of Asbury Park, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And you, this is the Asbury Park Tilly because he's got the hair that kind of curls out into those little horns. And the uh, Coney Island Tilly, his hair curls down and in. Although it's 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 rumored they're based off the same person who's supposed to be Eustace Tilly. But uh, who is like, I guess, an owner of the parks or someone who invested in the parks at one time. Um. But the, the, the Asbury Park Tilly, I find it's way more stylized and a little bit more fun than the Coney Island Tilly, who kind of looks more like Harry Houdini to me. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, 
Yeah, so uh, actually, I wanted to go into since you work in a lot of different media, can you uh, talk about like your process, like your studio process, working in different types of media and how they overlap and how they're different? You, uh, you know, go into that a little bit. Yeah, so so I've been. Um, we talked a little bit about Tom Sachs at the beginning, and his his, his real inspiration to me was the use of different materials, um, particularly what he calls bricolage which is just using different materials to make new things. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I would think of myself really more as a collage artist than anything else. So these are mostly done in, in watercolor, color pencil, and gouache, which is just kind of like a, uh, like a, like a tempera paint, which is a little bit nicer and, and more opaque version of watercolor, usually used for illustration. And it's more immediate, but I, I find it's... Um, it's way more fun than um, painting with a lot of other materials for me. Um, well, this came from that uh, that wood cutout, right? Like this whole leap concept kind of originated from the Osagras uh, woodcut, right? Yeah, they all came. They came from the action figure, which is where I kind of got the ideas from. Uh, from the Suck Lord, who was my main inspiration, in making my own character. I 3D printed my own ske chubby skeleton, and then I built a whole kind of brief uh, lore around him. And then I made a flying um, character shirt. Character, oh, I can't, words aren't working. It's like a character based uh, for my solo show at the main gallery years ago, uh, which basically just like a Super Mario with a skull head. And I used the same kind of stance for uh, all these characters, the Osagrasse, the Fat Bone character. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I really, I've really grown to like the stance. Because, like, it's hard to come up with, with a, a position that is really original. I mean, I don't think you can even copyright a posture. Um, yeah. yeah. But it, not that people won't try. Um, but, uh, but like I, I, um, I think there was this artist Mike Martin, who does like a lot of uh, illustration for comic uh, of comic book stuff, and he he did a whole series of like um, side profiles of of uh, different characters, like from Marvel comics and and DC comics and movies. And I was like, oh, it's great. He's using the same form. And then applying it to all these different characters, and he he paints things very photorealistic. He also did one of of uh, Superman, it's super, like the old twenties um, or thirties Superman with his hands on his hips, kind of standing there. And then he turned he he then dressed Superman in all these different characters. My favorite one is the, it's still Superman, clearly dressed as Wonder Woman with the crown on in the in the Superman stance. Yes. It's so awkward looking because he's still built like Superman wearing the uh crop top and and, uh, and shorts <laughs> that's great and, and and i was like oh this is great you're taking the same form and you're kind of messing around with it uh and taking the same shape and, and reworking it um but this one is just like the super mario but this is just more more straight up superman than um than the uh super mario one i did which is just super mario just a superman but I think this one's gouache. Uh, maybe, maybe some maybe some acrylic paint pen, but um, these are mostly done in watercolor and water mm -hmm. and, and colored pencil. Um, I mean, not only is it the stuff I have most on hand, um, but it, it goes on paper so easily. It's so easy to get your ideas out from your brain to your hands to the paper. Like I love working with wood, but like there's a process to it. You have to sand things down. You have to. You have to spray it sometimes, or you have to paint it with a brush and then cut it. Um, and the way I work is, I, I often will will kind of sit down and I'll and I'll pump out four or five projects at once. <clears throat> so some of these, I didn't even finish the 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 original drawing until I uh, I didn't even start painting them until I finished the initial drawing. Or some of these were drawn, like the pencils for all of these were drawn at the same time. Some of these, like four or five were done at a time. And then some of them are like, oh, actually, I have to pull this back out. I'm going to redo part of this. 
which is why you have multiples of the same character. Yeah, you see the, uh, the, the, the decision making, which I really enjoy, especially card making. Like, I love seeing decisions being made and you know, seeing like multiples of, of one type you know, shows that there's you know, that, that happening. So, and that's a good, it's a fun process to explore. Yeah, I really wanted to make these small to make them affordable as well. Um, because you spend a lot on, on with art, you always spend a lot on displaying and framing things. But if you make it small, it's much easier to find. If you can make your stuff in, in, a, in a standard size, it's really easy and cheap to find framing and easy to ship. You know, like you don't have that uh, issue that you have with like a wood piece like I normally my larger pieces um but i but part of me also really loves seeing like working in in large um i like working large but it, there's something yeah. freeing about knowing that like this there's only gonna take me a few hours each one and being able to like you know walk away from it and come back without having to, the the process of getting ready to paint these is much much simpler Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. But I, I actually started recently, as this series ended, started doing the ones that are slightly bigger. But I have made a few five by sevens again. Yeah, and well, this is also uh, it shows how something like this crisis will make a form of a show. You know that you had to send it. Uh, via mail to the gallery and you know there's this there's this pragmatism that's really interesting you're sort of like it's like you're that what we were talking about earlier with limitations you know like it's funny it's it's it, it, i think the show makes it more interesting that you have to like this had to be sent you know because of this crisis like the crisis is somehow forming the show like yeah we right? even talked about bojana's uh how do you say her first name mm -hmm. the other artist at the main gallery Oh, Boyana? Boyana. Okay, it is Boyana. Um, and, like, she wanted to do installation, but she really couldn't because of the restrictions on... Right. Yeah, she had this whole different show plan, and we, because of the nature of it, it would be complete, almost completely lost, you know, that all this effort to install something really elaborate. And it's funny because that was really, the, that was kind of the first, like, really... Fully installation. I've had installations done, of course, you know, but it was the first, and of course, it happened at, at this time, like literally the worst time. So in four years, this is the worst possible show to have this kind of crisis in. <laughs> so, so, so we decided to do another series that she has been working on as as a placeholder, and then next year, uh, April 2021, we're going to have uh, her show uh, at M Galleries, uh, the first gallery. So. Yeah, and she had to she had to scrap this this elaborate um, installation idea because it just it wasn't possible to even have anyone in the gallery to view it. Yeah, yeah, uh, right. That, that's exactly right. And like then, it would so, be. Yep. Someone could touch something and then transmit something to someone else. I mean, it would have been a real crisis. Yeah. Yeah, it's really unfortunate that that uh, I mean. It, it is what it is, and you know. But I, I, I find that really upsetting. The idea that like you have this really great idea, and you have a space that's you know there aren't a lot of spaces that can accommodate that kind of project, and then this happens, so it completely pulls the rug out from under both of you. So the uh, just so you know the audio is, is kind of muddled for me. I couldn't really hear you too well. Just a heads up. Oh, okay. Well, it just, it's just unfortunate. It just suddenly became that. Yeah. Yeah, it's just unfortunate that it, of the timing, but I, I can't wait to see it when it when it actually happens. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, that's it, the way it was it was described to me. It's going to be very it, the the whole the whole gallery is going to be transformed. Yeah, so any, are there any further uh, questions or comments? I'm uh, I, just uh, letting okay. people know that they can ask questions if they want to. Of course. Yeah, because, like, 
I, I love the idea of doing like um, installation, and, and in some ways, um, you know, my, uh, my 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 philosophy on art is uh, more is more. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like if if you if you have an idea, you should do fifty of them, and then it, it'll take on a brand new meeting. Like multiple, right. I think, is a really interesting way of dealing with a project. And I used to make multiples of, I would just make copies of the same exact thing over and over and over again. Um, and I still find, think that's an interesting way of doing art. But like nowadays, like I have to think of the reality of like, well, if I'm going to use all these materials, I then need to like be able to uh, cover my expenses so I can make something else later. So making, right. taking the same form and then changing it a little bit, each one of them becomes its own um, experience and its own project. And so then I can like, uh, they can kind of all have their own life and they can also kind of exist or work outside of the realm of the, um, oh God, I just check on the connection, of the... Um, of the project as well. Cause there's nothing worse than like you have, you have a, a piece and it's like, it goes home with somebody. It's like, Oh yeah. Well, it only made sense when it was amongst a group of other, you know, a hundred other things, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would hate for someone to yeah, it's gonna be work, like, Oh, all those levels. Sense yeah. in my house. Yeah. And no, I think I, I cannot agree more about the, uh, that, that, but the, uh, one of the major things that I find interesting about art and art, art making an artist is that when you're dedicated to an idea, even for like just a brief time, but spending time with and uh, just one kind of basic concept and then just different iterations of that makes it, it, it some wonderful things start to start to pop up. You know, when you do when you think that way, and you know, thinking in series is something I really am in favor of, and that's the shows like because it's hard to you can't fake that you can't fake that dedication to a series right so that's uh i find that really authentic so shredded hand asked me uh any plans to make sticker versions of these pictures and actually i was thinking oh, about right. doing that because there's a woman i make stickers with um uh stick em up ink in um now she was in jersey city she was in newark then she was in jersey city now she's in elizabeth uh and she mm -hmm. she makes most of my stickers um with the exception of uh the paper ones that i had a graffiti artist in colorado make for me um she does great work and she's local but part of me d felt like if i printed these out smaller than they already are you lose a lot of quality although mm -hmm. because of the, because they're so painterly i guess that it kind of messes with the printing process although right that's good yeah, I, I do like the idea of, like, having just the Homer character in the leap uh, with maybe the... the, the oh, yeah, spot makes a lot of sense, yeah. Like, Photoshopping the background out and having a series of those. The only thing is, though, the, the stickers are expensive. Like, so if you, if you want to get your bang for your buck, you want to try and make as few designs as possible and as many multiples as possible, the more designs, the more costly it gets. Well, at least costly per sticker. So yeah, right. I would really want it. I wouldn't want to do a character that I thought wouldn't translate or people wouldn't get excited about because I don't want to just make stickers for me because a sticker is even more ephemeral. Uh, than than these paintings are my normal work is mm -hmm. yeah very much so um although i remember when i started doing the the print stuff i i started making t-shirts was like oh it'd be fun to make a t-shirt i was in the process of making another wolverine super mario where it really looks like super mario's wolverine and it's a nine by twelve image and uh i stopped painting that painting just so i could scan up the original and, and I printed it at this um, online on this place called Printful where my friend Tatiana does a lot of her um, individual uh, merch stuff from that I really like. She, she's a painter. She's a, 
she lives in Middletown, but she teaches in Rawway, and she's someone I worked with in the past. She's a great artist on top of it, and she makes a lot of her paintings into items like clothing items and and prints and stuff, and the quality is really good, too. But if I was going to do stickers, I would really like to work with um, stick em up ink, because, especially now with there being uh, all this issue with local businesses. I, I want to try and support as many local artists and arts organizations that I can. Hey, that's that's terrific. Yeah, I think especially my gosh, like that's so needed now. You know, like we all, we, all, we all need to bond together. You know, as as art makers and art supporters. Yeah, and I think like her main her main um, business is basically making stickers for graffiti artists. I see. And so like she makes sticker slaps for people who are going to put them outside, and mm -hmm. so. Uh, you know, when the economy is down, th those are the kinds of businesses that that really get affected because the pe their the people, their customers just can't afford. You know, to to buy stuff. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, if I if I'm gonna do a sticker, I'm definitely gonna try and take one of the characters, just do the characters, because the die the, when she does the die cuts, it's so great just seeing the stuff that like takes its actual shape. Yeah, and that's like coming back to the whole like, what do you work in different? Like, what other media do you work in? You know, to, sticker is one of them for you. You know, it's become that. Yeah. Like, so I think that, yeah. When I did my paternity leave show, the first show I did, right? Yeah. Um, she printed all the postcards. And, oh wow. And she doesn't normally do postcards, but she said she could do it. She gave me a great price, and. Um, those postcards still look as good as the day we handed them out. Like I still have some left. Um, oh, right and on. I bought, and I bought later. I bought just on a whim because I got a coupon for Vista Print, and those postcards aren't nearly as good. Um, no. Uh, and, and also, like Vista Print's gonna be fine. Like you know, they're uh, they're they're in Canada. They're gonna do just fine after this. They're a big business. They they'll just kind of ship things around. But like you know. Someone who has a you know, a three M printer or whatever Epson vinyl printer with like where she has to put the actual extra coating on it herself, like that's the person I worry about. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah, we're, we're definitely in that. We're the our environment is definitely framing how we think about what we do, you know, especially like everybody, you know, but artists, you know, for sure. You know that we're rethinking the the process of things. Like I remember when we were talking about mailing the show. Like I would have loved the the idea about you like putting all these in the mail. You know, so there's something about like the form, like the image reflecting how it got here. It's like it's flying through the mail to get here, and it's sort of like this Ray Johnson style. Like it would have all those markings like on the back of it, like a postcard. So I'm like, this is really, I, would, I want to do a series of mail art now, kind of like Ray Johnson did. And just because of like of the current climate that we have to deal with. Yeah, I remember, I remember when we were at Mason Gross, one of the printmaking teachers was like, yeah, you know, aesthetic isn't as important as concept because you could really send something in the mail and have the, the aesthetic of it being handled by mail carriers is just as valid as the aesthetic that you would put into something with the mark making on your work. I'm just like, that's brilliant. Yeah, I should be mailing stuff in the mail. And I made a lot of postcards over the years. Even like my um, my Patreon um, gifts are usually postcards that I've either hand collaged or hand painted because I love the idea of getting stuff in the mail. Um, and to me, there's like nothing yeah. better. Right, there's something compelling about that. Yeah, I'm a little nervous about the idea of, like, sending stuff that's going to be handled to people, especially, like, you know, my Patreon supporters are, like, friends and family. So, like, I would worry about right now sending them anything physical, <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. Um, but uh, soon enough, I, I feel like at a certain point, um, especially if I could put a coating on something where I know they could just, you guys could just, like, spray it with alcohol and I don't have to worry about them contaminating anybody oh yeah no i think i think it's more or less a safe way to get art yeah you're right you probably should wipe it down before and after oh, if, you, if you can 
in my house. Like, I spray all the mail with alcohol, like, with isopropyl yeah. alcohol and water. Um, and I've heard, like, people were telling me today, like, oh, yeah, you really just have to leave it out because it doesn't really stand cardboard or uh, paper that long. But I'm just like, well, I might as well just clean stuff just for the sake of being careful. Yeah. And, like, when I, you know... And like normally, I love the like when you when you in the past when you've mailed like an, I'm a proud Patreon supporter of Dave uh, here, so definitely check him out. Um, he said I love getting these like pieces, these artworks sent in the mail with, and it has this like this patina of mail carrier. You know, I love that. I love getting that. It's like rough rough around the edges. There's markings. There's all these like things that. that are unintentional that just it shows the process of getting here, which I find really interesting, along with like the explicit artwork. So I like having that journey along with it. Yeah, and, and also with like the possibility that the U.S. Postal Service may go away in the next couple years. Uh, right. I, I feel like I really want to try and use them to my advantage as much as possible. Like. Uh, <laughs> And I, and I feel like, you know, people always complain about the post office. And I feel like the worst part about the post office is not the postal workers. It's like the other people in line with you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like yep. people who are like, or are stressed out because they want to try and get their thing in. Or they're like, they didn't put the right postage or they don't have the zip code. Uh, and I'm not throwing shade at those people. I've been those people at some point in time in my life. Um, and people are busy or whatever. But like it's kind of magical that we have this giant organization that like I can go to their website. I can arrange for them to come to my front door and pick up a box and send it to my friend in the next County. And I know it'll get there just fine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, that's like amazing. Yes. Oh yeah. Really? Yeah. It's, it's quite remarkable. Like the post office and libraries. Like if you, if you try to start those things now, everyone will be like, you are nuts. Why would we ever <laughs> make that? Right, right. Yeah, well, we're definitely going to start to see this evolution. And I mean, we're feeling it now, but this evolution of, of how, to, how to have that art exchange, you know, like having a physical space, you know, the limitations of that and like, what's what are the benefits of that too? You know, like this, for example, like I, I love being able to do a stream from the physical location. It's very different than doing it from, I think, a studio or you know, like there's something else that this provides, like this kind of space that can't be, it's hard to mimic. And I want to, you know, keep that going as much as I can. Well, I think like part of the, um, part of the, uh, the way M galleries works with the main gallery and, and the PNA gallery you kind of run it more like artist artist space as community center you know like it's not just yeah. the yeah. you do the podcast you do the poetry nights we meet up on oh yeah on i try to Friday. maximize the physical space as much as possible so now i'm like rethinking like how do i use still use the physical space in concert with the internet you know that's been my what i've been meditating on for the past few weeks and I'm coming up with a few a few ideas. Some some are working, some are not. You know, but uh, I think more or less, you know, it's, we're going to come out of this uh, with some level of uh, understanding what we need to be done, and you know, going forward, like being able to continue. Yeah, all of this is is very strange. As I said, our, in the time of Corona, it is very strange. That's right, right, right. But you know, that's why I wanted to do the live stream, and I'm going to try and. I'm probably going to edit it down a little bit. Uh, yeah, so me, this is this is wonderful. You know, we're um, and it's, it's you know, it's funny. It's perfect because my phone is. It seems like the limit is two hours, so this is perfect. Like I'm about like I have nine percent left, and it's about like ten minutes, and it's almost eight o'clock. So it kind of worked out well. <laughs> I wasn't sure how long my phone is going to last. Um, so this, this is good to know, without any kind of like plug or anything. Yeah, I think I think this worked out really well. Yeah, also like the connection here at the Arboretum is not wonderful. Like I, it's uh the, the phone connect, the, there's really weak connection. So I'm really grateful I was able to 
seems like it's it was streaming the whole time, you know. So, but we'll uh, I'll check it out later. Yeah, part of me also thinks that like maybe even doing an installation in a space like this or outside, you could have like the camera record the almost do it almost like a, making a movie or a film. Yeah, traveling through an installation, but. I don't know. We'll talk about that off. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I would love to have some kind of, like, a robot. Oh, did I lose you again? Yeah. See, uh, that's how you people know it's real. Oh, did I lose you, Dave? Just for a second. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so... Yeah, I mean, this, this has been really great. Like, I probably should wrap it up in a second because I don't know, my, my phone might die. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's really great. Thank you, Dave. This has really been a wonderful talk. Yeah, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Okay. Is there a, so, yeah, I mean, we should we should definitely do something else, too, throughout the month, before the month's out, like some kind of event. So we'll talk about that uh, in the near future. Yeah, I think what we probably should also do is maybe take photos of all the the works and I could do it as a slideshow too. And we could talk about each one individually. Yeah. Me too. Oh yeah. I've been, yeah, absolutely. been continually doing that. So on the, uh, social media, you know, uh, sites have been taking care of that as I, much as I can. In theory, I should have images of all of them, but I have to just double check. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Look, Frank, it's my job to make the art. It's, you're the curator. It's, uh, that's right. I, 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 I document. That's that 